what would it take for you to feel like you you would want to get fully invested right now? What what shifts would you be looking at in the equity markets or other markets? What's going on in the economy? And I, I follow the uh, the OECD leading indicator for the U.S. economy, and I take a derivative of that. Well, that's been that's turned up, and it's above its six month moving average now, which is consistently signaled a buying opportunity, major buying opportunity for stocks. Welcome to the Market Call Show, where we discuss what's happening in the markets and the impact on your investments. Tune in every Thursday on Apple Podcast, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to the Market Call Podcast. I'm really excited to have Martin Pring with us today. Martin is really an icon in the technical analysis world. I remember reading his book, uh, Technical Analysis Explained, in order to get the CMT back in the late 80s. Uh, so that, but when did you write that book, Martin? Originally, it was uh, 1979, and we've gone into five editions. I think the last edition is, is complete now. I should go back and look to see which edition I have. It's pretty old, uh, but I remember I have notes all over it as a young man uh, learning the technical field. I learned a lot from you. And the thing that I remember the most from your work was that you had so many different ways of, of doing momentum. And, you know, I don't hear people talking about, about your momentum work much, but one of your books that I really liked was a book, uh, Pring on Momentum. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, when I did my paper, you know, back in the day to get a CMT, you had to write a paper. Now you don't have to do that. But back when I wrote my paper, I actually used your KST indicator and adjusted it for volatility and back tested it on the bond and stock markets. And uh, that was that was my paper, volatility adjusted momentum. So anyway, I'm delighted to have you on. And you. I know you're, you, uh, you do these interviews all the time, but I, I want to ask you about your progression because I don't know much about your, like how you got into technical analysis. I have a... Uh an economics background from uh, Southampton University in England, where they gave me a uh, Keynesian degree in economics, which I never used in, after, in the afterlife. Is that right? So uh, in economics, did you, were you attracted to economics? Oh, yes. Yes. But I, I think the, it's not a very practical approach, the Keynesian approach from, from the point of view of financial markets. I developed my, my own techniques to help me navigate through the business cycle instead. Yeah, yeah, because a Keynesian technique, you know, aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Yeah, how, how can you use that in markets? You, re you really can't. No, no, not at all. But I, I can see now that you're mentioning it, your work has more economic, a, a more of an economic bent because you're, you, of your cycle work and your your intermarket uh, models um, that we could get into in a little bit. So tell, can you explain like how you got into the business? Well, I was fired from the business I was in. I was working as a product manager in Lipton, subsidiary of uh, Unilever in, uh, in Toronto. And I wrote a memo to my boss telling him all the things he was doing wrong. And, uh, I had the stupidity to also copy the uh, the president of the company. Well, long story short, three or four months later, I was I was let go. They said it was a redundancy, but it was I think it was a bit of a combination of both, really. So I've been looking around in Toronto for a job uh, in in the advertising business for some time, and I'd been offered one and I'd basically gone through the community, which is a fairly small one. And so I thought, what else can I do? And then I realized that it was different from uh, Britain at the time where if you wanted to break into the business, you had to um, be, be in the right school and, 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 and the stockbrokers were partners, so they had to have capital and so forth. Well, none of that applied to me. But I realized that I could in North America become a broker because they're basically salesmen. As long as you get your, um, your uh, qualifications from these, Securities Commission, you, you, you're free to practice. So I, long story short, I ended up with a very good uh, investment house in Toronto, a company called AE Ames, and they were the, the second biggest uh, um, 
uh, investment house in, in Canada. And they had a, a training program and there was used to be a saying going around, Ames trains the streets. So I was really fortunate to get in with the top people in terms of the, uh, the training. Mm. So that's how I got into the business. Okay, so that's how you got into the business. But how did you get into technical analysis? Like that's, you know, it's there's, I would say like out of every 100 people that become in, an investment professional, less than 10 become a technician. Well, what, <laughs> one of the things about Ames is they had a great library. And in that library was a book called uh, Technical Analysis of Stock Trends by Edwards and McGee. And I took it home and I'm sure most people would go to sleep reading it at night but it kept me awake and I was really impressed with it. So that's how I start, I got my first uh, foot stepped into, or my first step into technical analysis. And then of course I bought a lot of other books as well. Joe Granville's book, Gordon, Jyla, a lot of books that were going around at the time. But then you got into this creative mode where you were creating your own methodologies and very prolific, you're a very prolific writer. I mean, I was looking at the number of books you've written. I can't believe it, actually. And I didn't even know that you had so many books. How right. many books have you written? <laughs> well, in terms of separate books, 18. But, wow. you know, Technical Analysis Explained is a big book, as you know. And that's in five editions. And each edition is kind of like writing a new book because you make so many checks. To make it worthwhile doing the edition, you need to put a lot of new material in there. So, but a lot of books, and I, uh, I've stopped writing them now. That's it. Finish, Capito. <laughs> Did you find that writing helped you in your own discipline? Oh yeah, it helped me. Uh, every time you sit down and write, you get new ideas which you want to pursue. So most definitely, yeah. So, out of all the books that you've written, which would you say is the most? What you're most proud of, and what you think has had the biggest contribution? Well, the biggest contribution, I think, is the um, technical analysis explained because it's, as I said, in five editions and it's been translated in uh, seven, I think it's seven languages, including English. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and it it's very broad. It covers everything. It was it was like actually one of the main textbooks, yours and John Murphy's back in the day. That was yeah. the main ch main outline back then. Back in the day, it was like, they picked the best books in certain fields that were out there. Like, like Elliott wave was, you know, Prechter's book on Elliott wave was Elliott wave. Yours was the general book on like stock market cycles and things like that. And uh, John Murphy's was kind of, there was some overlap in content between yours and John Murphy's, but, but John Murphy's was more futures oriented. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and the curriculum has definitely gotten, definitely more institutionalized. Well, um, I, I wanted to ask you just a little bit about your views about technical analysis in general for investors. What do you think the biggest value is for technical analysis for individual or institutional investors today? Markets, I think, are determined by psychology. People's attitude to the fundamentals are on the fundamentals themselves. And in technical analysis, we look at sharp patterns and so on and so forth, but there's a psychology underlying those patterns. And if we can kind of try and understand what that psychology is, we're in a much better position to be able to use those price patterns to our advantage. Mm. Really? So it's really more psychology driven then. Um, and it's interesting you say that from a economist perspective. <laughs> you mentioned momentum earlier in the momentum book that I, that I wrote. And momentum really is nothing more or less than a uh, sentiment indicator. I, I have a, when I used to give talks, I used to demonstrate how you could look, you have a sentiment indicator over here and you know, overlaid it with a momentum indicator. The two weren't exactly the same, but there was definitely a relationship between momentum and sentiment. And another thing that you did early on that you didn't see happening very much was multiple timeframes in single indicators. Because back then you didn't see that as much. You saw a stochastics and it was a 20 day or something like that. But you were more, you brought, I think, more to the table in terms of thinking in terms of multiple timeframes and cycles. Would you say that's a fair statement? Yeah, I, 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 do, I do work in that area. 
Yeah, that's definitely something that I th- I think added a lot to the to the discipline. So momentum explained that one was or, or pring on momentum. I think is actually I personally think that's your best book. <laughs> Everybody's going to say this technical analysis explained, but uh, yeah, yeah, I would say it's probably the most underrated of the books I've written. It didn't get a lot of recognition, and there's a lot. Well, I shouldn't say I wrote it. But there's a lot of very powerful information in there, which you're alluding to. Exactly. Everybody should, if you're a serious technician, you should, early on, you should read that because it's, it is, it's a very good synopsis about how to use momentum. And, yeah. uh, you know, and because when you Google your name for books, that one does not come up readily. Like, and I'm like, wait yeah. a minute, that's my favorite book that he wrote. Where is it? So I had to I actually got on chat GBT and I finally found it. Uh, and I said, I said, give me the table of contents because I wasn't at my library. Give me the table of contents of that book, and it just gave me the uh, gave me all of your table of contents for that book, which leads me to this whole concept of computerization, artificial intelligence, algorithmic trading. From your perspective, how do you feel the business has pers- uh, progressed? I guess pro- progressed over time, and what's changed since you've been in this business? And how, how have you had to adapt? Well, the biggest change of all, I think, is technology. And the uh, in the old days, we used to do our own charts by, by hand. Uh, we used to get them delivered through the mail three or four days after the closing prices uh, in, in, in a chart pack form. But if you wanted to keep your own stuff up, the only way to do it was to do it manually. And it wasn't until probably 1980, I think, that I got introduced to the Apple II and was able to uh, computerize um, the, 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 the charting. But then having said that, and that obviously allows you to get more up-to-date data quicker and over a wider range of um, markets and securities. But having said that, there's no, there's no substitute for updating your own data because you get to really feel what's going on when you update it. So a lot of economic indicators that I follow, I update those by hand largely because I don't want to spend thousands of dollars for a a, a, a supplier to supply me with. So it's mm. much easier to, to do it yourself. And then you learn a lot more as you, as you, um, as you put it in. The picture gradually unfolds. Yeah. I was, uh, I went to your website and got this report. You've got this intermarket review report and I printed it out. It's actually quite thick. Uh, with a lot of different contents. You have a chart of the month, asset allocation. So, you know, U.S. dollar-based asset allocation, long-term momentum, U.S. stock market commodities, very broad in its nature. Um, So how did you get from just single technical analysis concepts to this whole broad-based view of, it's almost like an economics paper when you, when you, maybe that's, that's the answer. I mean, you, all your charts they look like um, some of the economics research that I would get from, you know, brokers, firms, economists departments. So how did you get from, you know, your traditional technical analysis to this? Well, that, that happened because I, uh, after I became a broker, uh, I joined uh, the bank card analyst in Montreal. They put out a monthly publication, including a lot of long-term data. And so the, the, the term bank card analyst was not, a credit rating agency, they were analyzing bank credit as one of the factors that influences the stock market. But that they they had a great, um, not only a global outlook, but, but a, a long-term outlook as well. And I've always felt more comfortable dealing in monthly charts than daily or weekly, because the further, the shorter you become, the more random things become. And nothing is certain, except death and taxes, of course, but um, longer term charts using monthly data, I, tend, I think are much more reliable than, than the shorter term charts. The other th- the reason for using monthly is that it, the, mon- the monthly charts, or the, what they monitor is the primary trend. The primary trend dominates everything. It dominates the characteristics of the intermediate and the short term trends that underlie it. So in other words, when you're in a primary uptrend, a rising tide lifts all boats. And your your short term rallies have got a lot of a lot of uh, magnitude to them, and the corrections are relatively truncated. 
Whereas in a bear market, it's the magnitude is all on the downside for short term movements and the rallies are truncated and very deceptive. So that's why I use a lot of monthly charts. In fact, I don't think you in that edition, you said, I apologize. I meant to send you one of those uh, so you could take a look before the interview. I'm glad you uh, took the trouble to download it. Yeah, I wanted to uh, see see what you had, what you were doing these days. And one of the things that I noticed is that the long term picture seems to eliminate some of these problems that a lot of traders complain about, like uh, you know the the short term algorithmic trading moves and all that. What these primary trends trends still exist, uh, you know, and that's they will always exist. There's going to be maybe more noise, but when you back away and you look at these charts. It's uncanny when you start smoothing them out and you start getting rid of the noise, you could really get a picture and a sense about what's happening right now. So when you when you look at that today, what is your thoughts right now? We had a you know a, a bear market really that happened and started last year, and uh, we're trying to base here. It appears. What what are your thoughts now about the current market environment in the United States equities? Well, I would take it one step higher than the primary trend and go to the secular or very long term trend. Because these happen once every fifth or last, uh, on average, something like 15 or 20 years. And they dominate what goes on with the primary trend. And looking at a lot of different indicators, which I think you, you got in the publication there, uh, two or three of them in the stock section, some of these indicators are looking pretty ominous, but they haven't, they haven't quite turned over yet. And so what we may be seeing is a primary trend rally in under the context of a secular topping out process. My best guess at this point is that we are in the beginning, or I should say October marked the beginning of a new primary uptrend, but under the context of an overall topping out process in the uh, secular trend. And a secular trend is important because the average secular trend when you adjust it for inflation has lost 65% the value from peak to trough. That's a, that's a fairly sizable number over a 15 year period. Yeah. So, so maybe near term, we have a, a rally, but, uh, but we're in an overall topping process because we've had this gigantic bull that is now beginning to, to lose momentum longer yeah, term. The longer term is, but mm. there's not enough evidence yet to say outright that we're in a secular bear market. Got it. So it could be a pause that keep, continues, but it appears that it's definitely slowing down. How, how do you, from a practical perspective, because I know you are involved in uh, managing money for clients and things like that. How do you, from a pr practical uh, perspective, deal with this kind of a market? You know, a lot of people are fearful in, and uh, of the markets. What are some of the things that you are recommending to your clients as far as how to deal with this environment? We, you're talking about the subscribers or the money management clients? Uh, either things. one. Either one. But the money management clients give us the money to manage, so we we automatically manage it for them, or my partners do. Mm -hmm. In terms of the publication, we're we've been cautious now for about eighteen months, but we got started getting a little bit more positive a couple of months ago when some of the indicators started to turn, but. Not all the indicators have turned, so we can't be fully positive because, you know, you've got to think in terms of probabilities. And the probabilities are better than 50-50 that we're in a bull market, but let me 55-60. So you don't want to be fully invested in a situation like that because the most important thing about ma managing money is to, is to manage risk, first of all. Right. And I, you use diffusion indicators where you're aggregating up different components. Can you speak a little bit into how you came up with using diffusion indicators? Well, I saw them in a, uh, I think it was a BCD book. Um, or B, B, I can't remember the exact name of it. It's a thing that used to be put out by the Commerce Department using economic indicators. And they had these diffusion indicators. I thought, mm -hmm. well, that looks interesting. If you do that for the economy, why can't you do it for the stock market? And a lot of people already had because it's really, a, it's just a a fancy word for, for saying um, we're measuring a, lo a lot of different components that are in a positive trend or in a bullish trend or above a moving average or below a moving average or what have you. So it's nothing new to technicians at the diffusion index. 
Right. And now, now you've been incorporating ETFs. Do you find that ETFs are really good vehicles to use for in, individual investors? Uh, do you still invest in individual stocks? How, what is your perspective on that? I don't follow stocks at all. I follow ETFs very much, though. And I think um, that's one of the big in innovations that's taken place in the last 30 years is the fact that you can have ETFs on virtually anything that moves. So if you want to buy uh, technology stocks, you buy the XLK, for example, and you've got a diversified portfolio, which you can trade on the market, which you can buy and sell on the market. It's marked to market. Or if you want to buy uh, what looks good at this point is the, the Greek stock market. There's a Greek ETF that you can buy. So it, where, whereas 40 years ago, you, you couldn't do that. You had to buy ADRs and you had to understand a little bit about the market that you're getting into and, and so on and so forth. With technical analysis, everything is, is it, if, if, uh, expressed in the price. So that really helps. Mm -hmm. Gives you a lot more, more, more universe to choose from. So you had mentioned the, the concept of inflation adjusted um, indexes and things like that. You put a lot of emphasis sometimes on commodity prices. Can you explain to me what is your view on commodities and how do you generally use that as an input uh, in determining stock prices? When you say my view, are you where commodities are going? Is that yeah, what you mean? You on the stock market, like how, how do you use commodities as an input to determine the cycle for stocks? Well, the thing about commodities is they're part of the um, business cycle. And so the business cycle is a chronological sequence, no, nothing more or less than a chronological sequence. So you get the beginning, you're in a deep recession, they lower rates. Then that, the lower rate stimulates housing. More housing stimulates durable goods, purchase of durable goods. Then durable goods run, they run out of stock, so they have to inc um, put a new plant and equipment in and so forth. So there is a definite chronological sequence to the business cycle. The important thing for the financial markets is that the peaks and the primary peaks and troughs of bond stocks and commodities are all part of that sequence. So when you're looking at commodities in isolation, they're not really telling you that much. But when you look at it in conjunction with what's going on in the bond market, for example, and stocks, you get a kind of a good overall picture of where you are in the cycle. Yeah, that, that was something that really sticks out in your technical analysis explained book. Uh, you know, looking at the sectors, the intermarket relationships, relationships, and you have this kind of a sine wave idealized cycle. And then you say, okay, norm, normally, not always, but you know, stocks will bottom out in here, this part of the cycle, bonds will top out at this part of the cycle. So when you look at those confluence of indicators right now, is it is that aligning with a, a bull market right now? Well, it's kind of hokey, very hokey at the present moment. Sometimes everything falls into line and it's easy, relatively speaking. It's never easy, but it's relatively easy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's very fluid. And we have, we because there are three markets, this uh, each one's got a peak and a trough, that means there's really six different environments that take place during the course of the business cycle. And we measure these through our, our, our models, which we call barometers, one for stocks, bonds, and commodities. And that helps tell us where we are in the cycle. But right now we're in, we're in stage seven, which is not a quantifiable cycle because the bond barometer is bearish, the stock barometer is bullish, and commodities are bearish. That doesn't fit into our six convenient stages. And last month, the barometers went to a stage four, and this is kind of unprecedented. It would move so quickly from one thing to another. Mm. So my view is that we're in the deflationary part of the cycle and that next month, the bond barometer is likely to go bullish. And that would then put us into a stage two of the cycle, which is the most bullish stage for stocks. So statistically speaking, I'm not saying it's going to happen in this case, but statistically, stage two is very positive. When interest rates are falling and the stock market likes what it sees with the interest, the falling interest rates influencing the economy on the upside. Yeah, and that's not what a lot of people are saying right now, right? Uh, so, you know, um, but if you look underneath the hood, you'll see a lot of home builders are breaking out right now, which would be an early stage 
you know, type of a sector industry. That's exactly uh, right. That's and exactly then, right. and we had a massive uh, uh, shift, regime change shift. We saw the bond market. Uh, you know, the shorters were making a ton of money on the bonds, shorting bonds, and then we had this massive gap that uh, just about faced not very long ago. What two weeks ago, something like that. And th that changed the landscape quite a bit. In the meantime, the market momentum has been shifting from down to sideways to up. So we broke up in many of the moving averages. Um, uh, but, it's, but it seems to be in a coiling position. So you have a lot of these market participants that seem kind of, uh, shall I say, indecisive. But if you look at it from a bigger p picture, you're saying from what you're looking at, it, it appears to be leaning more towards the bullish side. But yeah. not completely. Not, not, not completely, because we're always dealing in probabilities, as you know. Mm -hmm. And if you only got like 60% probability, there's a 40% probability it's not going to work out. So you've got to adjust your portfolio accordingly. Yes. Yeah. So you might be, you definitely, right now, it doesn't sound like you're fully invested. What would it take for you to feel like you're, you would want to get fully invested right now? What, what shifts would you be looking at in the equity markets or other markets? Well, one of them is probably going to happen this month well, because our BROM barometer, on these models I'm telling you about, talking about, they're based on a two-month moving average to avoid whipsaws. And this month, the BROM barometer is at 50%. So that means if all the components are unchanged as of April, it's going to go, it's going to go bullish in April, which would be the stage two. So that's, that's some of the things I'm looking for. And that, another thing would be... Um, what's going on in the economy. And I, I follow the, uh, the OECD leading indicator for the US economy. And I take a derivative of that. Well, that's been that's turned up and it's above its six month moving average now, which is consistently signaled a buying opportunity, major buying opportunity for stocks. So I tend to look at these indicators and see what the indicators are telling me than what the, rather than what they're telling me on, on the financial channels. Because I know I'm going to get a lot of noise, unfortunately. <laughs> I was just on a call with uh, John Kosar, and he was, to your point, saying the same thing about like how you know turning on CNBC and and it's show business. You know, he was saying it's show business. People who are, have this look good in a suit, they say the right things, and but it's storytelling, right? But the, the it's entertainment, yes, yeah, it's entertainment storytelling, and uh, you know, it, it's you, having that data driven approach has worked well for you. So when it, what's interesting about what you're saying is that it's so systematic. It's not it's not like you're saying I'm trying to assess what the Fed is going to do and uh, make a prediction about X Y or Z. It's more of, of what is the data telling me, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did a, a, a an outlook a 2023 outlook on stock charts which you, you can follow on on YouTube. And I was very, I was quite bearish because of the situation with the secular trend I was telling about in the process of topping out. And at that point, all my primary trend indicators were, were still bearish. But by the end of January, quite a few of them had changed. And when they change, you have to change or you get left behind. So definitely date, be data driven, not, not psychologically driven. Which this is something that's really interesting because you're talking about the psychology and the momentum and the markets themselves, intermarket. You you have a lot of people who are fundamentally trained who will say, well, everything is so overvalued right now. But in the meantime, the technicals are telling you you should buy. Do you ever find, do you put any input at all into, into valuations? Yes, absolutely. But I use them as a sentiment indicator in a, in a good, mm. solid technical sense not as a fundamental indicator. Interesting. So yeah, so if the PEs are high or whatever, the multiples are high, that's just saying we're more speculative right now, but it's not necessarily a forecast that the market's going to come down unless it's at an extreme, I guess. Did I well, get that right? Or It's actually when it's at an extreme, but the markets are like elastic. They can go further to an extreme. So you've got to wait for the extreme and then the reversal of the trend to the downside or the upside, depending on the direction. But you take something like the Shiller price earnings, the Cape price earnings ratio. That peaks when that when that gets up to um, thirty or forty. Or, I'm not quite sure of the number. I can't remember now. But it gets up to an extreme and starts to reverse. That's typically the top of the uh, secular bear market. 
or second of, uh, sorry second of bull market and vice versa on the way up from from being down so i i find these fundamental indicators to be quite useful but only in certain points in time when they've reached an extreme and have started to turn mm. and right now what are they saying well they a lot of them peaked uh last year when the market peaked uh, but they're they're act, some of them are acting a little indecisively uh, there's a little bit of a rally going on, but that that's going to improve if we get this primary bull market. But it's going to be a it looks to me like a mini a mini bull market rather than a full fledged bull market. Mm. It's very interesting. Well, yeah, and, and it's amazing how you you could take fundamental analysis and uh, and have a forecast or have a narrative and then be completely wrong. Uh, and I think technicals help people get on the right side of things. You can't get too far off if you're following the price. Uh, but you have a lot of non-price related data points that you use as input as a uh, kind of a confirming indicator, it sounds like, or I'm not sure if that's the right way of saying it, uh, which makes what you do uh, unique in a lot of different areas. And it is, it is more like an economist's uh, perspective of technical analysis, which is, is really cool. Well, I call it techno technomics. Oh, technomics. Okay. Technomics. Yeah, that makes total sense. Well, you're going to be speaking at the 50th anniversary symposium for the CMT Association, which is a big milestone for the organization. Uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to that, that you're going to be speaking. How do you feel about going to New York and uh, getting up and talking to the group well I, I haven't been to new york since the last symposium they had and the 40th anniversary that they had 10 years ago so it should be fun that'll be catch, great yeah catch, catch up with a lot of old friends what what are you uh planning on kind of just for a little bit of a preview for those people who are going to go what are you kind of planning on delivering your message about well, you've had a little bit of a preview already because I talked about the secular trend, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Is the I think the title is something like uh, "Is the secular bull market still alive?" or something. Mm. What a question mark! And so that's that's what I'm talking about. And I've got a lot of interesting indicators that help you monitor the the secular trend, and also explain why statistically why that having an understanding of the direction of the secular trend. Is very very important because it 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 should um, I wouldn't say cloud but it should help you make better more sound decisions if you know the direction. But unfortunately, a secular trend in the last fifteen or twenty years takes a number of years usually to reverse or the indicators to reverse. Because if you have indicators that reverse at the peak and trough, then they're going to give you lots of false signals during the course of the secular trend. So you have to kind of balance that timeliness with sensitivity. So it sounds to me like your process is definitely more long-term in terms of managing money for clients. And do you ever find that during that those regime shifts and you're moving maybe a little bit slower that clients get antsy about like not particularly feeling comfortable about a slower moving approach? Or I'm just assuming it's slower moving. I don't know. but Well, I, I don't deal with the clients in our money management arm. Um... Mm. But in, in terms of subscribers, um, we don't hear very often from them because they understand the process. In the publication, we try and uh, put all the explanations possible so they can understand where indicators are going. And we have on our website, we have a lot of articles that are purely related to the intermarket review as, mm. to, as to what indicators we have and how you use them. Mm. Very so we good. don't get we don't get a lot of that. The only way they express their uh, doubts is when they uh, counsel, which is not very often. I'm glad to say. That's good. That's that's a good sign. That's a good sign. Well, I know we could talk a lot. Um, I know time is limited for you, but I want to thank you again for coming on and just. Oh, thanks give, for having me. Give us a little preview. It's nice to finally be able to talk to you from the person that I actually learned so much about technical analysis as a young man. So that's. That's uh, a ple my pleasure for sure to, uh, to be able to do that. Well, thank you. And I hope you make the symposium later on this month. For the latest episode of the Market Call Show, make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube.
Go to marketcallshow.com for all our past episodes and sign up to get alerts for new episodes. If you enjoy the content of this episode, please leave us a five-star review and comments. The information in this podcast is informational and general in nature and does not take into consideration the listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific, individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision. WealthNet Investments is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where WealthNet Investments and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure.